Ready? Okay. So, welcome back. Where do we were last time? I was trying to convince you that uh, cosmic rays seem to propagate, at least heuristically, in a diffusive matter uh, uh, and quasi resonantly. Um, this diffusion is slightly different from the type of diffusions you might have seen in the past, in the sense that it's collisionless, namely the change of um, direction, this sort of stochastic change of direction along the direction of the field. Huh? That's what we consider huh? some regular field, which was later perturbed a little bit. And we argue that, you know, on the unperturbed field, the, the motion would be just an helicoidal motion huh? for a charged particle. But once you introduce this fluctuation, and in general, an ensemble of them, uh, you had some uh, type of random motion along the, the field, uh, and this random motion um, is resonant. So somehow the, uh, you need the wavelength of the perturbation. So a cosmic ray of a given Larmor radius would pick uh, the, 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 the power in magnetic fluctuations associated to the, to the, to the wavelength that matches that Larmor radius. That is the, the heuristics that we saw last time. And today, we go on on the more formal description of cosmic ray propagation. Um, what I mean by more formal, uh, I mean a description in phase space. Mm? Uh, we are going to be interested in, in statistical description of these, uh, or the evolution of this ensemble of charged particles. And um, the, the, the goal is to, the first goal is to reach, to prove that under some conditions, cosmic ray uh, obey a diffusion type of equation, okay? That's the first goal for, for today. Now, um, the key quantity we are going to use uh, is the, uh, the single particle uh, phase space distribution F of T, X, and P. Huh? This is the position and the momentum, the, con uh, the associated momentum of, of, of a, a particle. And the definition uh, is related to the infinitesimal number of particles in a uh, phase space volume, d cube x, d cube p. Hmm? This is the definition of f. This is now a relativistic invariant, the number of uh, particles. And the phase space volume is also a relativistic invariant, although neither of these two elements is separately a relativistic invariant. And uh, the, 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 um, the goal is to find a suitable equation to which this function f obeys, okay? Now, um, of course, this is relativistic invariant, this is a relativistic invariant, this is also a relativistic invariant. Um, now, what you may find in papers, sometimes talks, etc., uh, is you might find written that F obeys a Liouville equation. Now, let me first write it down, and then I'll, I'll comment on this point. Uh, the Liouville equation, uh, quote unquote, that you find is this one. A dot is a derivative with respect to, to time. Huh? Scalar acting on f equals zero. That's the kind of equation you are told that f obeys to. Now, uh, while not completely wrong and true under some conditions, first of all, this is a slight misnomer in the sense that uh, typically the Liouville equations. Uh, the Liouville equation refers to the density in phase space of the whole ensemble, okay? So an ensemble of n particles is described by, you know, uh, the positions of the n particles and the conjugate momenta of the n particles, and it is in fact true uh, in classical mechanics that, uh, in Hamiltonian mechanics that you might have, um, I hope you're familiar with, that in fact these 
n particle distribution function obeys this equation, no? where now this derivative is really over the n particles uh, coordinates, and this depends on all the coordinates of the whole ensemble. And this is true as long as f uh, obeys Hamiltonian dynamics, okay? Uh, which is equivalent to say, you might have heard that in different forms, that the, uh, you have a conservation in phase space. So a volume, for instance, of initial conditions is mapping into a volume that uh, uh, is conserved. So in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in your uh, symplectic space, uh, 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 this, this volume is deformed, but it, it, it conserves uh, uh, its size, okay? Uh, so I, I don't, don't be afraid of all these things. I'm just trying to connect the concepts and equations that we are going to use to more fundamental concepts you might learn in uh, analytical mechanics. Uh, and uh, I won't prove anything. Uh, there are some uh, extra um, notes and appendix with the link between, you know, these analytical mechanics concepts and equations we are going to use. I just want to make the link because this is confusing sometimes. So this is true. Well, as long as your system is described by an Hamiltonian, this is true. This is not always true. This f refers to a single particle. Huh? And we think that all particles are described actually by the same f, no? which is again another assumption. This instead is always true. Under which condition is this going to be true? Mm? This is, so what does it mean the little f as compared to the capital F? The little f no? is going to be given, apart from a proportionality factor, is going to be given by the integral of the capital F over all the coordinates, but the ones of the particle that we care about, okay? Let's call it, if this is number one, this would be x2, p2, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? If you integrate over all the other particles, you can obtain this single particle distribution function from the big particle distribution function, okay? Now, if your Hamiltonian system is separable, which means basically that your Hamiltonian writes as the sum of hi, and each hi only depends on the coordinates of the height particle. Huh? For instance, imagine a, an ensemble of free particles, and your Hamiltonian is the sum of the kinetic energy uh, uh, of the n particles, then these would be separable, okay, and uh, of this form. Under that type of uh, assumption, then it's true, it's rigorously true that this holds. Hmm? And uh, in the appendix you find a, a sketch of the proof. In general, however, in the case of interest, we have charged particles, and charged particles do have mutual forces. So your Hamiltonian contains terms where you have the potential of particle J acting on particle I, and you should sum or all Js, okay? All the other particles. So this is not true. And in fact, that equation is not exact. However, what one can prove huh, is that if you write down um, not only F, not only the integral of this capital F, curly F, over all coordinates, but you also write down equations for two-particle distribution function, three-particle distribution function, and so on and so forth, which means you integrate the big distribution on, on n minus two particle coordinates, on n minus three particle coordinates, etc., etc., you can get an exact hierarchy of equations, which is of this form. This would be a, a, a function g of, let's call it this way, f2. And this f2 now depends on x1, p1, x2, p2. Mm? Then you have another equation of the form f2 dt depending on another function, uh, 
j of f3, which depends on x1, x2, x3, p1, p2, p3. What do these functions describe? This is the joint probability of find one particle around this element in phase space and another particle in this around this element in phase space. Okay? You get an infinite hierarchy, an infinite set of equations which are coupled. And this is this ensemble huh, is equivalent to this D capital F dt equals zero. So they have the same content. Okay? If you have what you have learned to call molecular chaos approximation or Boltzmann approximation, so basically uh, particles do not have memory of each other, huh? so that this guy is basically factorized in the product of the argument of this function is, is basically depending only on the product of f x1, p1, f x2, p2. Hmm? The Stossel ansatz, sometimes called. Huh? Molecular chaos type of, uh, uh, of approximation, then, then, your equation, first hierarchy of the equation, this one, uh, just writes in this form. I omit the one. Uh, it's in general an integral differential equation, which, however, only depends on f, which is known as Boltzmann equation. We have followed some kinetic theory or basic statistical mechanics. You might encounter it. Okay? This piece here might be very complicated. Might be an integral uh, over the whole phase space involving, you know, multiple entries of this f. It's not a linear operator necessarily. Hmm? However, it's closed. It means you don't have to solve any more an infinite hierarchy of equations. Hmm? What is described by this term? These are essentially small scale type of interactions, huh? like collisions. Hmm. So, long type of interactions of the mean field type are enclosed in the term here, p dot. P dot is what? Is Newton's law, right? This is a force. So the, the long range average force enters here. The small scale forces enter at the right hand side. Okay? So, sorry. So for the rest of this lecture and next one, I'm going to focus on this left hand side. Hmm? So I will take this right hand side to zero. I will assume that particles somehow don't interact microscopically. There are no, you know, reactions uh, producing new particles or annihilations or decays, things like that. Otherwise, they would contribute here. And we will reinstate this when we deal with collisions. Okay? For the time being, we will just consider the evolution in absence of short range type of interactions. And these conditions is equivalent to assume that our particles only obey this equation, which I also write at the top. Now, this is not, strictly speaking, the Liouville equation. Formally, it has the same f shape, right? In the, the true Liouville equation would just write the same way, but then the x and the p are the whole n x and the whole 3 n p, right? Um, this is sometimes called um, collisionless Boltzmann equation. Hmm? And in the limit where, in the case, sorry, it's not a limit, in the case where this term, the forces, are generated self-consistently by the same particles that are described by this distribution, then it's also called Vlasov equation, especially in plasma physics uh, literature. 
So don't get confused if you hear about collisionless Boltzmann equation. Um, Vlasov equations, they are basically the same type of beasts. Okay? So that, that has nothing to do with the problem at hand. It's just to make the link between what we are going to study and, in general, the bigger picture or where does this fit in, 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 uh, in a statistical mechanics or analytical mechanics setting, okay? Um, so keep in mind, we are doing a number of approximations here. We are assuming that there is a sort of molecular chaos so that we do not really need to take into account correlations among particles. Hmm? And second, we are, for the time being, neglecting uh, neglecting uh, essentially uh, short-range collisions. Hmm? Okay, so far so good. Um, now, one further thing that is going to help us is the empirical fact that we will try to justify um, theoretically that cosmic rays uh, have a flux that is essentially isotropic to better than roughly per mil level, okay? So uh, this fact suggests that you might want to use some sort of angular average uh, a quantity to give a, a first description of the system, and then you can use, you know, angular dependent quantities as correction to that, okay? Uh, there is a deeper reason, uh, a, a mathematical reason why you, you, you can prove actually that the isotropic uh, uh, average dominates, but we will see shortly. So, if I write the the d cube p element in spherical coordinates, so that this writes p square d p d omega. Here, this is the the the, the solid angle. Huh? Uh, I I have a, an interest in defining f uh, uh, phi, which now depends on time, position and just the modulus of the momentum as the angular average on my f. I can also defy, uh, uh, define um, other moments uh, of this distribution. For instance, I can define a capital phi vector, always dependent on t, x, and modulus of the momentum as 1 over 4 pi integral of the uh, um, omega p hat of f. This p hat is nothing but p over its modulus. Okay. Yes. The omega, the omega. Omega is the, uh, if you wish, uh, theta and phi describing the angular part of the momentum. So, if what does it mean that your flux is isotropic? It means that it depends. It doesn't depend on the arrival direction, right? So you describe the arrival direction with a with a with two angles, right? And these are the angles on, on, on which you integrate. Uh, not on integrate, you average. There is a 4 pi division. Huh? Now, there are a couple of quantities that are also used in, uh, in uh, quoting results. So I, I, I introduce them to you. You might do the whole theory without them, but these are used, so uh, it's worth, it's worth um, uh, introducing them. I don't know, maybe let me start. Uh, I can introduce here at the top. This I don't need anymore. So, the first quantity is called often, but not always. There is some ambiguity. Spectral intensity. Now, this is essentially the number of... Okay, let me write it. It's a function f, which depends on time, depends on the position, depends on energy or the modulus of momentum, but it's typically quoted in energy units, and uh, omega being the, 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 the angular arrival direction coordinates. 
So this is defined as the number of particles, cosmic rays, that you get per unit time, per unit area orthogonal to, to some um, defined direction, per unit energy, per solid angle. Okay? Now, how does this relate to these quantities? Well, or f, or phi, etc. It's useful to rewrite the d cube x as a beta, this is the velocity, dt, dA orthogonal. Huh? The volume element is now rewritten in terms of this surface element that you have chosen. And if you do so, you can rewrite this as f d cube x d cube pi, uh, sorry, p over d t d a orthogonal d e d omega. Huh? Then I replace that in, so I can rewrite this as p square d p d omega for d cube p, and then for x I can write beta d t d a orthogonal, and a lot of this stuff simplifies. Okay. And I end up with f p square beta dp over de. dp over de is e over p. And this is 1 over the velocity. So at the end, we get this simple expression f times p square. Now you should implicitly assume that p is expressed, and also the argument of f is expressed in terms of energy. Th this is just a definition. Experimentalists tend to quote results in terms of that. So I just want to give you a link between the, the this, sometimes this is loosely called flux. Huh? But this spectral intensity is a more correct name and the, the, the phase space distribution that we have just introduced. Okay? And another quantity which is also um, sometimes introduced, let me write it at the bottom, it's called spectral, in, spectral density, n, always function of t, x, uh, e, but not angle anymore, is essentially related to the integral over omega of that one, more specifically, it's defined as 1 over beta of the integral over omega of f. So this is now integrated over the solid angle. Huh? And you can immediately relate it by the, uh, to 4 pi p square over beta times phi. I may I use here p square times f, huh? the integral over omega gives me 4 pi phi, and that's the relation. Okay. Again, just because sometimes you you find the equations written in terms of n, or or this f, so don't get confused. They are uh, they can be obtained one from the other. Okay. Now, um, next point is to, 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 to make more concrete this Vlasov equation for the problem at hand, which involves uh, cosmic rays. Huh? In particular, we want to consider the evolution under a, a magnetostatic type of condition. Huh? So we have an externally assigned field, B of X, but not T. And we want to know how the cosmic ray evolves. Huh? So let's just rewrite this for the specific case at hand. This is nothing but the derivative of F with respect to T, and then I will erase the, this, general, this general one. This I can rewrite as V, X dot is V, 
scalar gradient of x, of f. This is the force. Which force? It's Lorentz force in the uh, relativistic case. So this is Q, the charge, times, let's write P cross B over energy. This is the relativistic way uh, to write it, times the gradient with respect to momentum of F equals zero. Hmm? So this is nothing but now the, the this Vlasov equation or better collisionless collisionless Boltzmann equation, because now this is an externally assigned field. Huh? It's not sourced by F. We are not considering this case yet, at least. Uh, this depends in general on the position. Again, is this equation exact? No. It's exact under the approximation that, in fact, you can neglect collisions, small scale collisions, huh? and there are no correlations among particles. So, for instance, such an equation would be wrong for a crystalline type of material. Hmm? There is an implicit assumption of rarefied system. Um, now, the point is that we do not know what is the magnetic field configuration in the galaxy. We do not really know B of X. This is unknown. At best, what we can think of knowing is some sort of coarse-grained expression of this field. Think of the regular field of the galaxy along spiral arms. And maybe we have some knowledge or some uh, parametric uh, description of the departure from that in terms of some fluctuations of the field delta B of X. And of this delta B, we only know some statistical properties, like the power spectrum. Okay? So, in practice, this is a, an ensemble average. So, if we were to generate an infinite number of galaxies, uh, each one with a realization of these fluctuations, uh, the average among these uh, n galaxies would have this field. But this is a fictitious thing. It doesn't exist in nature. What exists in nature is this. But we don't know it. Right? So, let's see what happens to the description in terms of our distribution function if we perform this ensemble average. So now we are going to describe some statistical quantity, which is the, the, the distribution of cosmic rays averaged over an ensemble of fictitious galaxies. Keep this thing in mind, because at the end of the day, we want to compare whatever prediction we have with the, the cosmic rays that we measure in this place now. Huh? So there is an, a leap of faith <laughs> in doing this. Okay? So if we perform this ensemble average of this equation, we get something for bracket uh, uh, F, which is nothing but derivative, partial derivative of F plus V scalar gradient of bracket F plus we separate these in the ensemble average plus the fluctuation. I keep the ensemble to the left-hand side and bring the fluctuation part to the right-hand side, and then I get Q uh, P cross B ensemble over E hmm, of the gradient with respect to P of this equal to minus, let me, yeah, minus Q ensemble P cross delta B over E times gradient with respect to P of delta F, where delta F is the difference between F and this ensemble average. Okay? So we have learned a couple of things here. We have learned that in terms of the ensemble average distribution function, that's not conserved. It does not obey derivative with respect to time of ensemble average f equals zero. 
contrary to the F. Mm? F is conserved. Ensemble average of F is not. Is this puzzling? Well, you are doing some sort of coarse graining. Mm? So you are losing some information. The entropy must increase from an information theory perspective. So it's not crazy that you do not conserve these, these sort of reduced information distribution function. The second thing, I wrote this residual piece at the right hand side. If I do so, I'm going to interpret it as a sort of collisional term. This is the formal translation of what we did yesterday when I told you that somehow it's like the cosmic rays are scattering against these inhomogeneities. But it's a different type of scattering because this is not a collisional, collisional type of scattering, it's rather a collisionless type of scattering. Huh? Or if you wish, you can consider it as a collision with quasi-particles. So if I keep this analogy, I will interpret mentally this piece as, uh, uh, as a collisional part. What's the result of the collisions, according to the heuristic uh, reasoning that we had yesterday? Basically, the momentum direction is fluctuating. Huh? It's a stochastic variable. We, we express this in terms of the pitch angle, huh? mu. Um, and um, and what, what does it mean physically? Huh? If you have a distribution of particles, say a beam of particles, and you say that the momentum is being subject to changes of you know, direction, at the end of the day, this process will isotropize your uh, system. Okay? Uh, yes? I just want to get how you see get to the right hand side I mean, I replace B, I write B as ensemble plus delta B. Huh? Then I, I take, uh, I take uh, first of all, in whatever I'm going to do, you have implicitly, we are doing some sort of linearization in this fluctuation delta B and delta F. Okay? Then, if I write, so there will be a sort of higher order, um, it's, uh, maybe it will be clearer because I will show another way to derive this result. So maybe it will be clearer afterwards. Let me do one, one step at a time. If it's not clear, you can come to me and ask again, okay? Let me introduce one concept at a time, otherwise <laughs> we get a bit lost here. Um, I, I just want to give you, at this point, the, the, this term is the mathematical description of what we heuristically introduced yesterday in terms of this diffusion coefficient in, in angular space. Hmm? Now, we don't know an exact expression of this term. So you have to resort to some type of approximations. Which approximations will determine which theory incarnation you are working with, within? Okay? The simplest thing that you can write for this term the simplest thing that you can write for this term is simply to use uh, something which is ba basically called B, J, K uh, ansatz hmm, in the literature. If some of you have studied transport theory and uh, kinetic theory, you might have found it. Otherwise, just ignore it. The, the link to the original paper where this is introduced in the, is in the notes. So this is a equivalent to just say that this term we can describe as minus nu theta theta. This is the frequency of scattering in, of the angle that we estimated yesterday of basically um, um, uh, the ensemble average of F with respect to its angular average phi. Okay? And if you remember eta theta theta, we estimated as omega. This is the relativistic gyro frequency times delta B over B naught square at the resonance point. Huh? So what does this mean? 
it means that over a time scale related to that, your ensemble average distribution would tend to the angular average. That's the mathematical translation mm, of this approximation. Now, to be a little bit more precise, what we can do is to write ensemble average of f as basically an ensemble average angular average plus, so this is a double average, eh? <laughs> plus three times p hat ensemble average phi. Hmm? These are the quantities, the angular average and the, the angular average of the p hat that I just erased here. Okay, so this is not exact, again, this is an approximation. To be exact, I should develop in all multipoles. Huh? This is a monopole term, this is a dipole term. Why do I, I can do so? I can do so because I told you that this is quasi-isotropic, empirically. Huh? And in fact, in this theory, you can check that uh, this piece is smaller than that. Huh? And higher order pieces will be smaller than this. Okay, so this is a well-defined uh, uh, series expansion. Now, if you plug this into the previous equation, hmm, you can get uh, two equations, one for this and one for this term. Okay? Um, if you're s puzzled by what this term represents, this is equivalent to a current term. Huh? In fact, the, the formal definition of the current associated to the cosmic rays is nothing but beta times the average of phi vector. Okay. So you can write this f in terms of phi, or you can, term in, you can write in terms of the current density. Okay. So if you plug this in, you can factorize the pieces that depend, that do not depend on momentum from the pieces that depend on momentum. And you will get two equations. These two equations are derivative with respect to t. Let me uh, avoid now the, the, the ensemble brackets for to, to, to ease a little bit the notation, but keep in mind that this should be implicit. Plus beta divergence of phi vector equal to zero. Hmm? This is equivalent to an equation that you should know, hopefully. Continuity equation. And the other equation is going to be derivative of phi vector plus beta thirds radiant of phi plus omega vector, let me introduce this in a second, phi minus nu theta theta phi vector. Sorry, no, I denoted with capital phi. Huh? You see where this term comes from, right? I plug in there, so this term at the right hand side is just this part, so this is what remains. Huh? And in terms of the current, I can also write this as derivative with respect to the current plus beta square over three of the gradient of the flux plus omega cross j equal minus nu theta theta j. What is this omega vector? This is nothing but the same omega I introduced here, but in vectorial term. So the omega vector is nothing by definition, is q ensemble average of p over e. Yes. Okay. <coughs> mm. 
These are just two ways to write the same equations, one in terms of the phi vector, dipolar piece, or in terms of the current. They are proportional to each other through beta. Huh? Now, if you remember, we estimated the eta, the, sorry, the new term, and the new term was of the order of, you know, omega times delta b over b square, and this is very short time scale. We are talking about hundreds of seconds, things like that, okay, for typical condition. So hundreds of seconds is a very short time compared to the time scale of evolution of astrophysical cosmic ray fluxes. So over those time scales, of course, this is an energy dependent statement, but for most energies, this piece here hmm, is much faster so, uh, than this piece here. So basically, this is constant over the time scale over this, this is varying. So at, as a first approximation, I can drop the derivative in time of the current. Huh? And if I do so, you see that this second equation huh, is just a linear relation between j and the gradient of phi. Huh? If you write it in matrix form, this is something like, you know, uh, 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 gradient of phi i equal to some a uh, i j uh, j uh, j. The way to write it is not like this, but equivalent to that. People write j i as minus k i j. I'm using Einstein notation, I sum over repeated indices, dj phi. That's by definition. This, this is a definition of k i j, of this matrix k i j. If you are curious about the shape of k, what is k i j, from just the, inver the inversion of this relation is beta square over three nu theta theta, nu square theta theta, delta ij plus nu theta theta uh, omega k epsilon ijk plus omega i omega j all divided nu theta theta square plus omega square. Hmm? The eigenvalues of this matrix, huh? if you basically what, what this comes from, where this comes from, you rewrite this in coordinate notation, you define your matrix Aij here, and you invert. That's how you, you do it. Huh? You have some eigenvalues of this matrix, huh? and the eigenvalues are basically beta square over three nu theta theta, and this is the eigenvalue for the eigendirection corresponding to the background field, parallel to the background field, and then you have the eigenvalues corresponding to the direction orthogonal to the field, these are going to be beta square, three nu theta theta, plus or minus i omega. Now, these are orthogonal to the direction of the field. Notice that eta is a factor delta b over b square smaller than omega. Huh? So in this denominator, it's this piece which is large. Okay, what does it mean? It means that this eigenvalue is much smaller than this eigenvalue, which physically means that your particle has a much harder time propagating perpendicular to the field than diffusing along the field. Okay, if you remember what we did, I did, I, I threw under the carpet yesterday, I told you that we would neglect the changes of trajectory along X and Y, and I will focus about the trajectory along Z, and this is the mathematical translation of that. It, th your particle changes, diffuses much easily along the field that orthogonally to it. Okay? 
the other thing which is crucial is that once I use this expression, this, this, sorry, this one, huh, I can plug into, the, into my equations huh, here, and that's what I get at the end of the day. So I use that expression for j related to gradient of, uh, of uh, phi. I plug into the first equation here, huh? or the first equation here, and what I end up with is this type of equation, derivative with respect to time of phi is equal to derivative with respect to xi of kij, derivative with respect to xj of phi. This is the first important result for today. You should know this equation. It's a diffusion equation. Huh? For instance, if k is constant, independent, uh, constant, it's independent of position, you can take this out, and in the isotropic case for k, for instance, this is the heat equation. Okay, so the angular average, ensemble average distribution of cosmic ray be behaves like heat. Okay. Um, let me, let me, before the, the pause, since you asked the question, let me uh, reformulate this in a slightly different way. Maybe it will be more clear. So, uh, sorry for taking five minutes before the, the pause, but I, I prefer to introduce it right now. Um, there is an alternative approach, or maybe a more formal, uh, systematic way to do the same thing. Uh, which is known as quasi-linear theory. Okay, so uh, what does it consist um, of? It consists of taking the equation for the, the complete equation for f uh, and taking the equation for the ensemble average of f and subtracting the two and this makes emer make, make emerge the, the delta f which is our expansion uh, uh, parameter. Okay, so I will show you where, where the approximation hidden there uh, comes from. If you take the two and subtract, so the exact equation and you subtract the equation for the ensemble average of f, you get the following equation. Of course, f minus ensemble average of f by definition is delta f. Huh? So I can write directly the derivative with respect to t of delta f. And this is equivalent to delta f plus v gradient of delta f plus p cross omega scalar of p of delta f equal to what? Hmm? Here is the approximation. So I, I set this equal to minus q P scalar delta B over E gradient with respect to P of ensemble average of F. Why this is an approximation? This is an approximation because the true, um, the true relation, in fact, in order to write this, what I'm assuming is that I can approximate Q P cross delta b over e scalar gradient of uh, delta f equal to its ensemble average. Q p cross delta b hmm? and you're right that this is not exact but I'm assuming, in, in fact, it's true that the difference between these two quantities is higher order in this delta F and delta B. Okay? So if I do that, I have this approximation, which is now consistent with what I wrote before. Huh? Okay. 
Of course, the only way to convince yourself is to repeat all these passages uh, slowly. They are in the notes, so hopefully you won't get lost. But I want you to, to understand the logic of what we are doing. Oh, that's the key. Um, now, please notice that this equation here, written with this approximation, at the right-hand side now contains ensemble average of f. Huh? And this is a first-order differential equation for delta f. Now I can integrate it formally, huh? in general with the method of characteristics. Huh? So if you, if you know what it is, you, you find it again. If you don't know, forget about it. It's just what I'm going to write here. So basically, delta f is going to be given, let me be explicit, of time, you know, position, and momentum. If you want to be general, it's going to be. Huh? Is given by some initial condition for delta f at t0. Huh? minus the integral between t0 and t, dt prime, of p cross delta b over e, scalar gradient with respect to p of, sorry, ensemble of f, evaluated along the, um, it's like, like that along the characteristic as a function of t prime. What are these characteristics? These are the unperturbed orbits. Huh? You remember, the ones around the b average. Okay? You should evaluate this expression along these trajectories. Okay? That's the formal solution. Now, if we have this solution, this is delta f, you see that I can um, plug it back here. Hmm? Now, if I plug it back there, I will express delta f in terms of ensemble average of f. This gives me a closed equation for ensemble average of f. Okay? If I do so using this, huh, what I get is this derivative with respect to time of ensemble average of f is equal, it, you know, this is always an approximate equality, huh? it's not exact, but in this series type of thinking, is given by the integral between t0, there are two pieces in principle, there is this piece and there is this piece. However, as long as your initial fluctuations are uncorrelated with the fluctuations of the fields, when you average, this is zero. Hmm? What we're saying is that the fluctuation in an ensemble average sense, these are not correlated. Huh? So the only piece that remains is the second one. But keep in mind this approximation, because in a specific realization, there is no guarantee that this is true, and this goes away. Huh? So this is going to be given by dt prime, what? Q square p cross delta b over e gradient with respect to p of what? p cross delta b again over e. Huh? Dot f with respect to p. The whole thing evaluated around the characteristic. Now, this is a ugly thing. Huh? However, uh, you find something that should evoke a diffusion term. You see, for instance, that there are two momentum derivatives here. You also see that this guy is quadratic in the field fluctuations. Huh? And remember, in our approximation, we wrote it as equal minus nu f average minus phi, no? But nu was what? Is omega times delta b square over b. So again, this has all the features of what we wrote before. It's slightly more justified mathematically. 
Mm? And also, it paves the way to a systematic expansion. In principle, you can get uh, more from this formalism than what I just wrote here. Mm? This formalism is known as quasi-linear theory. Um, in fact, under some assumption, I mean, in general, this is a monster. You don't know how to evaluate this. Huh? If you make some assumption on the nature of the turbulence of these fluctuations, you can prove a, a, an identity. I'm just stating it, and then we stop. These the, the specific mathematical assumption needed are things like the, the, the uh, uh, stationarity and homogeneity of the turbulence, and things like the, uh, the gyrotropy um, uh, symmetry, in the sense that basically uh, the, the F does not depend on the angle theta around your characteristic. Okay? Uh, you find the whole list if you are curious in the notes, but under some assumptions, you can prove that this term assumes a much more uh, human form, and in fact, you can prove that F obeys this equation, derivative with respect to T, sorry, average, um, ensemble average of F, of course, plus V mu derivative with respect to Z. This is the only coordinate that remains under our assumption of F equal to derivative with respect to mu. This is the pitch angle, the cosinus of the angle between P and the, the B field, the one that we introduced yesterday. D mu mu derivative with respect to mu of ensemble of F. So under some assumptions, we find again the same sort of result. However, now written in terms of this diffusion coefficient in terms of momentum space. Huh? So please note that this is a diffusion coefficient in momentum space. Huh? In particular, it's the PZ, mu is PZ over P. The other one is a spatial uh, diffusion coefficient. And these are just the two sides of the same coin. Hmm? Basically, um, if your particle changes momentum with some frequency, it will also propagate spatially with some other frequency. And the two, in fact, are inversely related to each other. Okay? So in this formalism, you can still get from that the diffusion equation. Huh? The only thing is that you must introduce a spatial diffusion coefficient and then I conclude for a, pr a break. Huh? The spatial diffusion coefficient is defined in terms of that mu mu as, as following. V square over eight integral of minus one, one of d mu one minus mu square squared over d mu mu. You can define uh, equally a moment of this F. Huh? In particular, F naught is defined as the, the integral over the average over the pitch angle. F1 is defined as V alpha is the first moment, not the zeroth moment, minus 1, 1 d mu mu F. Uh, and you can prove that this equation, this quantity now, you see that this is another sort of angular average in our approximated um, uh, symmetric condition. This obeys uh, basically the diffusion equations that we wrote before. Hmm? D F naught over T is equal under this approximation, derivative with respect to Z, of k derivative with respect to z of um, f0. Okay, we find again the diffusion equation in spatial terms, and you see more specifically the link between the diffusion coefficient in space and the diffusion coefficient in, uh, in momentum space. They are inversely proportional to each other. What does it mean? If, it's, if a particle changes direction very fast, then it doesn't move very far. 
If your particle changes momentum very slowly, then it propagates spatially very far. Makes sense. Huh? So if you change your direction continuously, it stays stuck. Huh? So that's why it's inversely proportional here. Hmm? So this is just a more formal, systematic way to find all these results that I found in an intermediate level of abstraction uh, uh, previously. And in fact, uh, with this formalism, you can also prove quite easily that uh, the, the, the ratio of uh, F1 over F0, uh, the first moment with respect to the zero moment, is basically minus K over F0 gradient of F0. Uh, uh, and if you have a diffusion region of thickness capital H, a, 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 a qualitative estimate of this term is of the order of K over C times capital H. And this you can plug in specific numbers is much smaller than one. So what I want to say is that in this approach you can prove that your expansion, multipolar expansion, makes sense. And actually you can reverse the argument. If you are dealing with a cosmic ray propagation problem, you can try to estimate this thing, the ratio between the diffusion coefficient and basically the si C, this is the speed of light, times the size of your diffusion region. If this guy is much smaller than one, your diffusion approximation is consistent. If not, your diffusion approximation breaks down, and so you should not trust the results of whatever code is solving these equations, for instance. Okay, so uh, in the exercises I, I propose uh, for this afternoon, and Sylvia is there, so she will help you through, uh, you will see how you can use this, um, I mean, a concrete example of where things can break down. Um, and I stop now and for 10 minutes and then we reconvene for the final half an hour. Yeah, no, no, I just wanted to, you tell me when, when it's uh, ready to go. Go, okay. So prompted by some question, let me uh, tell a couple of things that um, maybe would help you understanding where this fits in your, uh, you know, mental uh, boxes. Huh? First of all, this relation, you might have seen or quoted it as fixed law. Huh? So uh, it's typical of diffusion processes. So I, I, I hope I didn't introduce something too shocking. The other thing related to this F0, F1, etc. what does it mean physically, the fact that, you know, F1 over F0 is small? Uh, when dealing with cosmic rays, there is, in fact, two meanings of velocity, right? There is the velocity of the cosmic ray. In general, these are relativistic, quasi-relativistic particles, so this velocity is of order C. But the ensemble of cosmic rays may or may not have some bulk velocity. Uh, so, think of the air in a room, the velocity uh, of the molecules in the room is very large, right? But you may have a wind or not inside the room. And these are, the wind is the macroscopic velocity of the bulk uh, distribution, and then you have the velocity of the single molecules, okay? So the V from which, or the P from which the F depends is the P of the cosmic rays, uh, the large velocity. However, this F1 is a current term, so somehow this, the fact that F1 over F0 or J over, over phi is small, it just means that as a bulk in this diffusion approximation, the cosmic ray moves non-relativistically, okay? So the current is small with respect to the density in that sense. In natural units, it means that their velocity is small. And if the diffusion approximation breaks down, you can get superluminal motion of your cosmic rays. Huh? This is the mathematical counterpart to the breakdown of this. Okay, uh, another couple of comments on uh, applicability of this formalism. Um, one is that in principle, you can extend this quasi-linear theory also uh, to compute um, you know, correlated ensemble averages, things like F A, F B. Huh? We use just for the single F. Huh? 
So uh, if you wish, this describes the, 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 the joint probability of getting cosmic rays. So uh, one practical application where this has been done uh, is to describe uh, the, the, the angular pattern of anisotropies of cosmic rays, uh, the multipole uh, uh, spectrum of the uh, cosmic rays, in particular by, uh, I think, Marcus Hallers that gave a similar course last year, and uh, Philip Mersch, who is in, uh, in Aachen. Uh, so, and, and it works. Huh? It describes pretty well how the, the multiple pattern uh, looks like. The second comment I wanted to make is that, again, we are, we are doing theory here. Huh? So we are computing things like this ensemble average, which ne it doesn't exist in nature. We have whatever realization we, we have to deal with, uh, and we are comparing these let's call it theory, with the observational distribution of cosmic rays, or if you like the other uh, flux uh, uh, definition, F observable or N ops. Mm? And usually, people don't even tell you about that. They plainly compare these with that. But there is a leap of faith in this step, okay? Who tells me that my ensemble average prediction is a faithful a description of what the cosmic ray I measure uh, give me. Uh, one research line recent in recent year has been to sort of assess what is this difference uh, um, in uh, with Monte Carlo simulations typically, mm -hmm. or with some semi-analytical theory as well. Uh, and of course, you can do this ensemble average uh, assessment of the uh, the difference. Uh, also, with, with respect, not only with respect to realization of magnetic field, but you can think of uh, source distributions or um, uh, time dependence of sources, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So different type of variables, and um, implicitly, people didn't care about that because, for a long time, the experimental precision of cosmic ray measurement was so low, was was so bad in a certain sense that forget about this. However, a few works have proven that for some ranges of energies, for some species, experiments like AMS02 are precise enough that you should be sensitive, start to be sensitive to this difference. Uh, um, for instance, due to the stochastic nature of the sources in our models, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So some of the features that you may see in experiments might not be telling you something deep about that. They might just tell you that this guy differs from the, a specific realization, okay? So just a comment, a qualitative comment. Um, another thing I, 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 I want to mention um, is that in general, uh, this is an empirical fact. It need not be so in principle, but it turns out that the time scales for cosmic rays to propagate, say, within the galaxy, and the time scales for cosmic rays that we infer for cosmic rays to be accelerated are rather different, okay? Um, typical time scales for cosmic ray diffusing in a galactic environment are maybe 10 million years. That's just to give you an idea from the source to us. The time scale over which we believe they are accelerated are maybe two orders of magnitude sh shorter or even less so, okay? So, this fact uh, basically allows you to factorize the problem of cosmic ray uh, astrophysics into a short time scale problem over which, and a short spatial scale problem within the source where you accelerate and produ produce the, the major feature of the energy spectrum, and another uh, much longer time scale over which you pro propagate spatially and maybe alter the spectrum. Okay, so this is not something that you could predict uh, in a, in isolated in a room. It's something that depends on the actual physical parameters of accelerators in the, in the, in the galaxy, and it need not to be so. There are acceleration mechanisms, we will comment about that, which actually act over tens of millions of time, sca uh, time scales distributed over the whole galaxy. Okay, so just a fact that nature has these efficient, relatively fast accelerators. Uh, what does it mean practically? Practically, it means that, in fact, we are not going to solve 
a self-consistent model usually from, from scratch, from zero to the final uh, outcome, but we rather solve a model of this type in the diffusion approximation. Huh? where we, we write a source term for the cosmic rays at the right hand side. Now this source term is, is whatever comes out of this acceleration phase that we factorize and treat independently. In principle, you should start from whatever background population of particles, thermal particles, and self-consistently do everything, right? Accelerate them, transport them, etc. Because of this separation of scales, that's not what people do. They compute whatever source term comes from the short time scale acceleration. They plug as a source in the right hand side of your diffusion um, uh, uh, equation and you solve for it. Huh? Um, and uh, uh, there is also another process which happens on much smaller um, and more local scales, which is the effect of our sun on cosmic ray fluxes. Uh, this is another important point if you want to compare a theoretical prediction with whatever you measure, say AMS rather than uh, a Pamela or any other experiment like that. Uh, the cosmic rays that we predict in this simple ensemble uh, type of theory are meant basically in the interstellar medium. However, before getting to the Earth, they have to enter the heliosphere. Now, you probably know that the Sun is magnetized. Okay, it has a magnetic field. Hmm? Not only it has a magnetic field, but this magnetic field is dynamical. In fact, one talks of a, a wind, a solar wind. Huh? So this is a time-dependent and actually space-dependent magnetic field. What happens when you have magnetic fields that vary? There are associated electric fields. Okay? So basically, when cosmic rays have to get to the Earth from the interstellar medium, they are experiencing some electric fields, which means that their energy spectrum is altered with respect to whatever is out there. Hmm? This problem is known as solar modulation problem in cosmic ray. Huh? Uh, I won't describe the, the details of it. Just get this idea. And there in, the, in, the, in the notes, there are some formula uh, in the so-called force-free ap um, um, approximation that you can use to map the flux that you compute in your theory outside the solar system in terms of the flux that you should measure. And there are references to the uh, theoretical papers that, that actually propose this simple prescription. You can go much beyond that. Nowadays, people really simulate the 3D structure of the field, propagate particles, and try to link these things. There is a solar cycle, right? So uh, 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 this, this correction is time dependent. But just to give you an idea, and, and actually you can do it, you can also monitor it uh, observationally and try to correct for this effect uh, through what is called neutron monitors. So these are other devices. I, I don't enter into the details of that. Uh, just to give you an idea of the, of the scale, the, the typical correction that you get is below a gigavolt. Okay? So this thing is going to be very relevant at low energies, low rigidities to be more correct in our description till now, and you can forget about it above, I don't know, tens of uh, gigavolt, okay? So especially to understand the shape, so if you, if you were to plot the flux of cosmic rays hmm, versus energy as a function of time, say every year, you measure always, say, the, the proton flux, you would find things like that. Ah, I'm, I, I told you that I'm a bad drawer. Something like that, okay? And this scale maybe is whatever, 10 uh, GeV for protons. Now, none of this is matching whatever is outside the solar system. The, the flux that is outside the solar system may be something like that. This difference is called solar modulation. Huh? That's, that's the only thing I wanted to, uh, to mention. I have no time to go. There is a wonderful theory, a lot of studies related to that. I don't want to dismiss it, just I don't have time to, to, to describe this phenomenon in detail. Um, but in principle, the pipeline for your study is you have to have a theory of acceleration, or somebody should tell you what to put here, or you use a parametric way 
for modeling that. Second, you solve your diffusion equation, and we are going to enrich this equation. This is just the, 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 the backbone of the diffusion equation. Third, once you have your interstellar medium uh, flux, you should modulate it if you want to compare with stuff at the Earth. If you need your flux to do, I don't know, calculation of secondaries like uh, photons, you don't need to do that. You just need to convolute whatever flux is in the interstellar medium with your target densities. Okay, so this depends on the problem at hand. Um, what about practical aspects of how people model these things? Um, the, the diffusion problem in our galaxy is typically modeled in a cylindrical approximation or even in a 1D approximation. What do I mean with that? Uh, I mean the, the, the fact that the galaxy is described as a sort of thick cylinder. Well, there is a, there is a, uh, a thin cylinder whose um, half thickness is little h, uh, and little h is maybe 100 parsec. This is roughly the, the thickness of the disk where stars and gas is. And this much uh, bigger thing of half thickness, capital H, is the magnetized medium through which cosmic ray diffuse. Hmm? And this radius here is roughly the radius of whatever uh, uh, astrophysical sources in the galaxies are. Let's call it capital R. And there is a hierarchy. Huh? There is a hierarchy of the type R uh, larger than capital H, and both are much larger than little age. Huh? Just to attach number, this is, I don't know, 15, 20 kiloparsec. This is maybe uh, 3 to 10 kiloparsec. And this is 100 parsec. Hmm? So sometimes if you, what people tend to compute are cosmic ray fluxes as a function of the distance from the center, the, 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 the height over the galactic plane, and these are the only two coordinates that you care about for cosmic ray diffusion problems in practice. As far as I know, there is very little study of 3D type of um, uh, modelization, especially since we don't know very much about these magnetic properties. And uh, sometimes you can even use a, 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 a 1D approximation where basically you consider this to be infinite compared to the scale you care about. So basically you model your system just like this. Huh? And you don't care anymore about the uh, radial, the radial coordinates. That the only spatial coordinates you care about is z, the height over the galactic plane. Okay. And for analytical purposes, in some of the exercises I propose, I will adopt this approximation. Although for research papers, usually pa either semi-analytical or fully numerical solutions, people tend to use this uh, this cylindrical approximation. So if you work in this approximation, your diffusion problem uh, simplifies even further, so your equation becomes d phi over dt uh, minus derivative with respect to z of k, uh, derivative with respect to z of phi equal to q. And usually astrophysical sources, uh, at least, uh, are taught to only live, essentially live in this very thin uh, plane. So basically, this Q, this source term, is typically approximated as uh, a delta, a Dirac delta, huh? times whatever spectrum of injection your acceleration theory gives you. Huh? So this is the simplified diffusion equation that you will find in some exercise, and some, some um, um, because this can be solved analytically. That's the simple reason. Huh? Um, and again, another exercise today uh, will, will give you some idea of how the solution looks like for a simple, uh, a simple case. Um, so far, so good. Ah, final thing. Um, how this diffusion problem solution look like? Hopefully, most of you have seen the heat equation. And even the solution of the heat equation for you know, um, uh, free escape boundary conditions, but I'm sure that all of you have solved the Schrodinger's equation. Huh? Free, 
the free uh, uh, particle huh, in quantum mechanics, and you know how the propagator of the Schrodinger equation looks like. Huh? So uh, you, you might notice that this is basically the same equation if k is independent of the space. Uh, apart for some h and i that enters here and there, but mathematically these are very similar. Okay, so in practice, just as a little reminder, so there is a whole industry, you can spend your life just solving this equation in more and more complicated uh, geometries and under more and more complicated assumption. Your baseline um, expectation to solve such an equation uh, How do people think of uh, uh, approaching it usually? Uh, typically, um, uh, one uses some Green's function uh, technique to solve it. Huh? Uh, so uh, what does it mean? It means that uh, you'd like to find some function g of uh, t, t prime, uh, uh, x, uh, x prime, such that it solves this equation, the associated equation. This is the same g. Uh, equal delta x minus x prime delta t minus t prime. And if you can find this solution obeying the appropriate boundary conditions, huh, the solution for phi associated to this source term is trivial in the sense that you can obtain just by quadrature. So phi of p t x is going to be given by the integral over d cube x prime d t prime of g uh, of t t prime uh, x uh, x prime uh, times uh, uh, q of x prime t prime. Mm? You have a just a convolution, uh, and this g in your quantum language is your propagator. Uh, for instance, for free boundary condition, where, your, uh, where uh, um, it vanishes at infinity, uh, uh, so we are not anymore in this situation, but we are assuming that the flux goes to zero at infinity, uh, then you, have, you can solve by, by Fourier transform. Uh, and the G uh, writes as the integral, okay, in n dimension, that's the... just to give you an idea of the, how the solution looks like. Huh? No derivation here. K, which in general is a function of the momentum, huh? times k square minus uh, i omega. Huh? And this gives one over four pi k t minus t prime to the power of n alf. n is the number of spatial dimensions. I am keeping it general here. Exponential of minus uh, x minus x prime square. Huh? This is just the, the Gaussian propagator huh? that you find for a free particle in quantum mechanics. And then there is a theta function of t minus t prime. Huh? <coughs> only a positive <coughs> times this happens. So what's the only, there is an equal here. So what's the only thing you have to retain of all this discussion is that in this simple case, hmm, in this simple case, uh, The typical distance a particle diffuses away from the origin in a time t, um, so let's call it d square. So the variance, huh? this is a diffusive process. This is nothing but this sum over i, sorry, xi minus xi prime square huh? vector of n dimension. And this is given by. 2n k t or t minus t prime to be uh, more correct. Huh? This comes from the fact, th this is the variance, okay? 
So you see that there is an N2 uh, uh, here. So each coordinates, basically, each coordinates uh, diffuses away with a variance which is 2K. Uh, for three dimension, you get the typical distance square a particle has uh, traveled away, which is 6KT. Okay? So this is equivalent to the spreading of the wave packet you have found in quantum mechanics. Uh, it's linear in time, the variance of your uh, packet. Um, okay. Uh, by the way, as I said, this equation can violate causality <laughs> at some point in some regime. Uh, this afternoon you will see uh, explicitly uh, how you can assess that for actual astrophysical objects, some astrophysical objects, and some energies. Uh, if you really need to correct for this superluminal type of motion, okay, a hard, a hard way would be to cut the regime of validity of your diffusion equation whenever you are outside of this uh, causality. Huh? Uh, there are also equations proposed to amend this. Where does this problem come from? It comes from the fact, if you remember, one way to see it is that we neglected the derivative with respect to time of the current with respect to the new uh, times current term. Huh? If you want to go beyond this approximation, you can. There are some uh, more or less rigorously proposed patches. One of these is the telegraphers um, uh, equation. So as an exercise for you to go beyond after, the, after the, the, this week, you can look at some uh, literature I mentioned where you can get a grasp of how to correct for this superluminality uh, issue. Um, so, so far so good. I have maybe five minutes, so it's a good time to have a trailer of what is going to come. Next, um, so you have always to have a teaser, no? A cliffhanger like the TV series. Uh, well, not as exciting, hopefully. But, uh <laughs> but um, anyway, so till now, all this discussion uh, has assumed that these these fluctuations of the magnetic field are uh, do not depend on time. Okay, they are fixed, static. Is this a reasonable approximation in the medium that we are dealing with? Okay, you might wonder, is this reasonable? Is this uh, uh, completely artificial, uh, theoretical uh, word? Um, a bit of the two. Hmm? And in order to introduce what I'm going to say, uh, let me remind you something that you should know. If not, please leave the room. <laughs> Namely, that if you have a fluid, <laughs> What happens if I perturb a fluid? Some continuum that obeys continuity equation, Euler equation, momentum conservation, as some equation of state. What happens? What am I doing right now? I'm perturbing a fluid, and you hear something. You generate sound waves. Okay? So mathematically, what does it mean? That if I have a fluid of density rho, huh? It obeys a continuity equation. It obeys an Euler equation, which is a momentum conservation equation. V is the velocity of this fluid. Huh? Now this is the macroscopic velocity of the fluid, huh? not the velocity of the constituents of the fluid. In fluid th theory, you don't have any microscopic velocity. We don't know what the matter is made of. Huh? And then you have some equation of state, huh? P, uh, which can be a function of uh, rho in the simple case, but it could be a function of the temperature, etc. and then you have to supplement uh, with some other uh, equation, which is what we call an equation of state. Okay? And that's basically where the microphysics is uh, hiding. Okay? This depends on the composition, on the temperature, blah, blah, blah. Um, this equation then meets some trivial solutions like rho equal a constant. Huh? Uh, for instance, you can have uh, p equal zero, v equal zero. This is a solution of this of this set of equation, for instance. But you can have uh, you can perturb whatever um, 
zeroth order solution you have found, delta rho, delta p, delta v, you plug in there, this is a linearization, of course, you plug in there, and uh, if you write, if you parameterize the ratio of delta p over delta rho in terms of the sound speed, what you call the sound speed square, otherwise this is just a parameter, huh? you can plug in this, and what do you get? Hopefully you have seen this in some courses. By now it should be on Netflix or something. Huh? So what, what, this, what this implies is some equation that if you, the set of equations in these linear quantities, you can solve, for instance, in terms of delta rho, and this is equivalent to this equation. Sorry, let's call it nabla square. Okay. How do you solve these things? Usually you do it in Fourier space, so delta rho equal d cube k over 2 pi 3 halves. Delta rho tilde in k space huh? e to the i k scalar x. Huh? And then you write the general solution delta rho k tilde. This is simply a of k e i omega k t plus b k e to the minus i omega k t and omega and k are related in this case by the simple relation omega square uh, of k is equal to cs square k square. This is the dispersion relation for sound waves. This is just telling you that they propagate with, with, with this, this feed at least. Okay, so now that's the teaser. What happens in our environment? We do not have just, uh, uh, you know, a density and a pressure, but we have also magnetic fields. Okay, uh, can we do the same? Of course we can do the same. If you were to do the same, let me just add it here, what happens to these equations. Let me erase here. So if you add a magnetic field and you work under an approximation which is very good in astrophysics, this is so-called magnetohydrodynamic approximation. Basically it means that your medium is perfect conductor. Okay, it's short shortcuts any, any uh, uh, fluctuation you might have immediately. Huh? There is, there is a, an additional term that comes from Maxwell equation. I'm not going to prove you that. This is just to show you the logic of what we are doing, and that's it, over 4 pi in my Gaussian, uh, in my Gaussian uh, choice. And then there is, of course, you must supplement this with Maxwell equation which in our case is basically only involving the, uh, the magnetic field. Mm? And of course, divergence of B is zero. I can do exactly the same thing that I did before. Huh? For instance, I can uh, have a solution where rho is constant, V is zero, P is zero, and uh, B is a constant field. This is our background situation that we used uh, in yesterday and basically today. Huh? With respect to what we have perturbed. Okay, you can do that. You can write B as a B0 plus delta B, V as a V plus delta V, etc., etc. You linearize. What do you end up with? You end up with an equation. And actually, the best thing to do in this case, you have coefficients which are independent of space. Uh, you go in Fourier space. Huh? So in Fourier space, which is the same passage that I did before, huh? I wrote delta rho in terms of its Fourier uh, transform. The system of equation is equivalent to a, something that I can write in matrix form. 
omega and k acting on the vector delta v k equal to zero. You can prove that. Okay, you transform your differential equation into an algebraic condition. Imposing that the determinant of this guy uh, uh, vanishes, you have the non-trivial solutions which are equivalently setting a relation between omega and k. Huh? And these are the dispersion relations of the modes that are admitted in this situation. Okay? So what are these modes? Um, there are, in this specific case, where the fluid is cold, huh? we have zero temperature, blah, 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 uh, the modes are something that resembles uh, sound waves. Hmm? The difference is that, so they are, um, they are in fact compressional waves, longitudinal waves, huh? but they, uh, um, in a certain sense there is a, a, a spring-like force which is contributed to not only by the hydrodynamic uh, aspect, but also partially by the, the magnetic field. Hmm? So you can think of magnetic field lines like uh, uh, springs. Hmm? They can be plucked like uh, strings of a, 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 a guitar. Uh, there are sound waves which are affected in their propagation by that. If this force is, con is going uh, to add to the um, restoring force of the sound waves, then they are called fast magnetosonic waves. If they act uh, in opposite direction, they are slow magnetosonic waves, and we don't care about that. What we care about is a new type of wave, which is a transversal wave that appears in this system. Okay, and these waves are called Alvin waves. These are transversal waves purely supported by the magnetic force and they are characterized by a dispersion relation which is, is trivial, so it's omega square VA square uh, K square. Hmm? Uh, and uh, VA as a vector is nothing but B zero over square root of four pi rho zero, the background density. So if you have a magnetic field, and now you perturb the magnetic field lines, these in general are not going to be static. They will generate a perturbation, which is transverse, hmm, and propagates with this velocity. Okay, so this is the end of this lecture. What we have to see next time is what does this imply for the picture that I just described? Because in that picture, I consider these things to be fixed. But now these things are not fixed. Nature tells us that they want to move. And they want to move this, this velocity. For typical parameters, this velocity is some kilometers per second, maybe 10, something like that. Huh? So, in our galaxy, of course, you can have in different situations. Of course, this mechanism can be generalized. This is what happens in the simplest case, cold, medium, constant density, etc. You have a whole zoology of modes that you can excite uh, when the medium is hot, warm. The medium maybe is not made of protons and electrons. It could be made of electrons and positrons. And you have different modes in each of these situations. Okay? But for now, just take this into account. By the way, this might look very simple to you, but essentially, Alphen Nobel Prize in 1970 was given because he discovered that. <sighs> okay, something that you can do in, in half an hour, uh, um, and actually even mentioned in, in, uh, in Fermi uh, paper of 1949. Uh, so essentially, the fact that you have these modes in plasmas is, is one field that has developed uh, uh, over 20th century. So it was not immediately realized, you know, after Maxwell wrote uh, uh, his equations. Okay, so let's stop here for today. <laughs>